Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. What you're seeing here are four really filthy boards. These belong into a Nintendo VS arcade cabinet and they're essentially dual Nintendo uh, NES electronics with some mods of course to uh, make them work in an arcade cabinet but I picked up this lot and uh, let's give it a try see if we can bring them back to life why are they sitting in the snow? they're being punished because they're so filthy and uh, these are going to go straight into the bathtub, get scrubbed down and uh, dried before we can even attempt to have a look at them. Some of them have really old leaky batteries in them. There are parts missing on them. So uh, I'm going to be on the lookout for some more parts, but uh, Let's see if we can get those going again. Well, they all got a bath. They weren't too happy about it, but judging by the color of the bath water, they really, really needed it. Now, the process was very simple. I basically sprayed them with lukewarm water from a hand shower, scrubbed the worst parts a little bit with a toothbrush, and uh, then dried them with a uh, hair dryer to make sure that all the water got out of the sockets and underneath things and uh, once I was happy with them being mostly dry I left them on top of a heater register or several heater registers overnight which probably got rid of any other remaining moisture in them and uh, here is a prime example of what, what, what they look like. Now why do we have two Nintendo Entertainment Systems sitting here? And that is because electrically this board is almost identical to two of these. The main difference is being that these output composite video, this outputs uh, RGB video, and uh, it has the capacity to for more input switches but other than that it is pretty much identical to these two I guess to take two of these boards and uh, tape them together so let's have a closer look at one of these boards so just like their forefathers, these were built not as dedicated to a single game uh, arcade boards, but rather they were intended to have you replace ROMs to change up the game uh, once the current game wasn't making money anymore. Except of course these, uh, they tried to keep it cheap, they didn't put cartridge slot on, slots on these, but rather they have six sockets on each side uh, that you can put up to 48k of EPROMs in that are the game and if you look at the topology of this so this is what Nintendo calls the uh, main side so this is like an NES a complete NES well mostly complete NES with some pieces up here too and then here's the sub NES which is uh, identical to this side. So uh, what these were used for were the Nintendo VS systems and I'll show you some pictures later on. There was the Uni system which played a single game well, it was a single monitor cabinet and then there was a dual system which had two, two monitors and you could have different games on each monitor one or two players could play and I think there were some games that you could actually have a four player game on but I'm not entirely sure how uh, how that worked but you can already see it, it's well you may it, the uh, this is not very complicated 
a CPU fits into here, which is a 6502 derivative, here and here. Then we have a PPU in here and here. And what is a PPU? It's a picture processing unit, a very, very early version of a GPU. The uh, Nintendo 8-bit was character-based, so you, you downloaded a bunch of uh, character definitions to it and then made up your screen of 8x8 characters that you were free to define. So far, so good. We can see there's memory on both sides. I mean, the layout is identical. It's got a battery holder because some games actually saved high scores uh, to be true to the arcade. It's got more switch inputs because uh, there were more controls. Keep in mind that uh, you had a joystick and two buttons for up to four players and uh, four start buttons on each side for each side of the game so the number of buttons was greater than in an NES and that's implemented in here and the switches are really simple they're, they're simply uh, grounding switches they're read into a shift uh, they are read into a parallel to serial con uh, chip and then the bits are shifted out one by one and the CPUs can read the state of the switches at any time. It's got adjustments for the RGB output here. You can adjust the colors separately for each side because there are two separate monitors. Now in a Unix system only one side, the main side, was used and the other side wasn't used but it was a wonderful move, economical move on Nintendo's side because they only had to make one CPU board. They made five revisions of this board, but they were all downward compatible, so they only had to make this particular CPU board, and it fit into a variety of arcade games. And uh, when you wanted to change games, you bought a new set of ROMs from Nintendo and put them in here, and voila, you had, uh, you had a new game. Now, it wasn't as simple as that, because even in those days, mid-80s, piracy was rampant. So, the way Nintendo did their uh, copy protection was they had a number of different PPUs, which had different, uh, which displayed colors in a different fashion. A lot of games will run with the, uh, with, with the incorrect PPU, but the colors will be all off making the game near impossible to play and certain games were actually wouldn't run if the PPU wasn't of the correct revision. And other than that there really isn't any a whole lot else. There was one one more static RAM over here that was basically that both CPUs could talk to and that's how they did intercommunication between the main and the subsection. But other than that, that's pretty much it. So what we should do is now the boards are clean, but we don't know how well they run. So we're going to have to come up with a way to test these, to bench test these. Next, I have to procure some parts to be able to test this thing on the bench. First part was easy. Switching power supply because it uses 5 and 12 volts. It also uses 24 volts, but that's for a mechanical coin counter or game counter. And uh, uh, I don't, uh, I mean, I'm not really interested in that. I'm not, not too uh, not going to uh, put a lot of effort into providing those uh, 24 volts, but if I ever get to a point where I need them, probably just get a small switcher that outputs uh, 24 volts and uh, hook it to the proper pin on the edge connectors, and then that way we can have a coin counter, but for now, I'm not going to worry about that. Next, we needed a way to connect everything together. And this mess you're looking at is a uh, rebuilt harness. I had, 
I got hold of a harness, but uh, it was it was hacked up pretty badly, and uh, it did take a fair amount of time to make it whole again. To add all the wires that were crossed and then cut off, and it, it was pretty bad. Well, the edge connectors were good, but uh, I had to add a bunch of wires to it, and uh, I think uh, this harness originally came from a uni system which was only wired for one of the uh, NES's on here so essentially first I had to clean up that part which was hacked and then second of all add all of the wires for the uh, subsystem because this is going to feed two monitors and it is going to read from two separate control panels uh, there was no point in showing that on video because it was just a labor of love, let's call it. It took an inordinate, inordinately long time to do this, but, uh, well, it ohms out right, so I think we're in good shape there. Next, we need an input device, and uh, this is basically one side of a... Uh, VS dual system or a uni system just has one of these has two player controllers which match up with an NES controller as far as a uh, number of con uh, number of controls on it it's got a four-way joystick and an A and B button and then it's got start buttons four start buttons and depending on the game of course if you play a game that only plays two player games only button 1 and 2 are active, if of course you've put your money into it. And then if you have a game that'll let you play four players at once, or three, that's what the other buttons are for. And then of course you need a second one of these for the other side, for the second set of monitors. And last but not least, we need a way to display it all. And yes, I could have used my old VGA monitor, but this is better. It's an open frame RGB monitor, and uh, one of the special things is, is that this, the uh, Nintendo board, doesn't have audio power amplification on it. It actually runs into the monitor and utilizes the monitor's power amplifier to create sound. Again, I could have simulated all of that easily, but this is an original VS system monitor, and it's actually somewhat rare because it's an 18-inch diagonal monitor, which supposedly was only made for the VS dual system, because who else would want an 18-inch monitor when you could get 19s for cheap? But as you will later see, there was a necessity to go to 18 inches because of space limitations. But this is an original monitor, and uh, this is what we're going to be using. Now, none of the stuff I showed you has been tested, so uh, so I don't know. There's a lot of variables here, and uh, let's go ahead and hook everything up with that beautiful harness I showed you. And what we're going to do is we're going to put ROMs and CPUs and PPUs and all of those boards and power them up and see what happens. So I populated a board and uh, on the main side I put uh, the pinball game in and on the uh, sub side I put Super Mario ROMs in. Now, remember, we can only see one at a time because I only have one monitor here. But let's have a word about... So, procuring ROMs used to be really easy. You, you could go to one of many ROM download sites and get the ROMs for these. But a few years ago, Nintendo cracked down on those sites because I guess they're starting to use their old games for re-releases on the Switch and whatever or they just objected to people pirating their ROMs, but uh, they were six, Nintendo was successful in essentially <clears throat> getting to a lot of 
at least at this point, U.S. ROM sites and having them take down all the ROMs. They even sued one site and got a got a pretty large settlement out of that. So to me, I, I, I had all of these boards before I washed them had ROMs in them, various ROMs. And they basically they're the original ROMs and they look like this. They're 2764s. Funny thing is, is they put this tiny label on top and they left the quartz window open. And what I found, I mean, I had no way of knowing what they were, but you know, they kind of tell you what they are. But some of these ROMs were empty. They were all FFs. And I think what happened here, first I thought they were, uh, they got zapped or something, but I was able to program them. I didn't have to erase them. I could just program them. They took a no program great. And I think what happened was, since the quartz window was open, these were left in the sun somewhere, and even the dirt wasn't enough to cover this window, and natural sunlight erased them after years of exposure to it, or months of exposure to it. But uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of ROMs, but I still needed some images. For instance, I had a full set of the pinball ROMs, but uh, that I could just barely read the labels on, but they were all blank. And actually those were defective because you couldn't program anything into them. So how did I find my ROMs? So I have a bunch of old PCs sitting around and one of my older PCs had an installation of MAME, the multiple arcade machine emulator. And uh, those usually came with a large uh, set of ROMs because MAME uses the original ROMs mostly, emulates them, and lets you play them on a, on a PC. And the version of MAME I had, had some of these ROM images on them. So I found, uh, I found the uh, VS ROMs on my old machine, and uh, I burned the ROMs. So I don't, I mean, I, I can't really test the ROMs. The way, the way I test EEPROMs when I get them is I put them in an EEPROM reader and uh, I just read them several times, one, one after the other, and I watch to see if the checksum changes. Because on a defective ROM, I mean, either, either it'll be blank, which the checksum will show you very quickly, or as you read as you read the ROM several times, the checksum will change, meaning it returns different data, and that means they're, you know, the ROMs are bad, regardless of what was or is on there, they're unusable. But with these ROMs, which were original in one of the boards, of course I removed them before washing, they all pass the EEPROM read several times test. These are the uh, Super Mario ROMs. And these ROMs came out of an old archive of MAME I had. So uh, we're ready to test this board. Everything is in place. One other note, when you get when you get chips, I mean, here's a PPU with the, uh, with the heatsink on it. This PPU, you may notice, didn't have a heatsink on it. But when you stack these boards, guess what rips off first? Uh, yeah, the heat sink. So I'm going to have to get some heat sinks for this. Nobody has reproduced these. So basically, this is it. Whatever you have, you have to be very careful with. I did check voltages <coughs> on, on power pins on all the sockets before <coughs> putting anything in there. But what I also did was notice that this is in a socket. It's in a 40-pin machine socket. And the reason I do that is I, I don't nearly have enough PPUs to keep all four boards populated, if they work, of course, and then just simply switch them back and forth in whatever way I use them. But I have to mix and match PPUs all the time whenever I put new games on them. And to minimize the risk of breaking any of the pins off, this really, really helps. Because if you're going to bend pins or damage anything, Usually the brunt of the damage will be taken by the socket and it's simply a matter of replacing the socket and not damaging the original chip. All right, enough talk. Let's have a look see at the monitor. 
flickers very nicely and excuse me I'm gonna have to turn on the power and it powers up I've set the dip switches to free play because I didn't want to have to mess around with simulating a coin drop on this but uh, yeah there you have it so let's see so yes as you can hear I've hooked up a speaker to it just a speaker that oops <laughs> uh, no problem though it didn't magnetize the mask and one very nice thing this has is it actually has a degauss switch where is it right in front so aside from the fact that it degausses when you're turning it on you can just press that switch if you ever get uh, if you get the mask magnetized and end up with a clean picture but but we can see the controller works this only uses the A and B buttons but uh, both well I can't do that both A and B buttons work Well, that's kind of interesting. I think there's something weird happening here because notice that the both of the scores that's really weird. Both of the scores are getting updated. That may be a config thing though. So there you go. So the main side works. Now what I need to do is do a switcheroo on the uh, harness, hook up the sub side, and see if that works too. Okay, now I moved uh, the, uh, reconnected the harness to have the uh, sub side connected to both the monitor and the controller. And uh, this is supposed to be Super Mario. So, excuse me again. And there you go. This also came up and it's asking me to insert a coin. Which is not really something I want to do. So let me reset this thing for free play. So I set up the dip switches for free play. The problem is any of these games you put into uh, free play it doesn't go into the attract loop anymore it just comes up with this dry uh, screen so you don't have to insert uh, coins but all right oops did it again. So supposedly this version is quite similar to the home version except that it's harder. Which kind of makes sense for an arcade. They don't want you to spend your whole day hogging the machine with 25 cents. Well, anyway, so the first board seems to pass. Nothing wrong with it. And uh, so I'm gonna, we're going to do quick tests on the other three boards and uh, 
see if at least we can get into some repair territory here. Here's board number two and uh, on the subside I have ice climber. I actually had two sets of ice climber ROMs but uh, they uh, I was able to make a good set out of the uh, out of the two sets I had and then I reburned them because those chips were in really really bad shape uh, but as luck would have it I did get a good set out of reading the two original sets but there I didn't even want to plug them in because they were uh, you know somebody had gone over them with an angle grinder or something so that's where these came from and this one's excite bike which also came out of my MAME archive so we are uh, we are running the uh, subside right now because that's what the harness was hooked up to and here we go so as you can see ice climber does work It's like an okay game. But yeah, so that one works. And next, we got to do the switch on the harness again to test Excite Bike. So here's the main side. We got Excite Bike running. And uh, that seems to indicate that board number two also works. Again, not very exciting, but uh, quite welcome on my end. Yeah, sure, I would have liked to do some uh, fault isolation on this. It's a simpler board, it shouldn't have been that hard, but uh, we don't need to do so. So I basically have four ROM sets that work. And uh, let's see how many, do, and I've actually tested uh, all the uh, CPUs I have and uh, three of the four PPUs that I have, and those seem to work. So what we'll do is uh, we'll just do some visual inspection on the other boards and give them a quick test. And if there's something interesting, I'll show you. Otherwise, I think we got all four. When we talk with next, we'll probably have all four boards fixed and running. On the remaining two boards, there were there uh, was one problem each, and I identified those problems through visual inspection. Actually, on um, one of them, one of these resistor packs was uh, broken had a big crack through and had separated from the rest of the body and that most likely happened when the thing was short, was stored in a haphazard fashion as these seem to have been but that wasn't a big deal it was a 1k by 8 sip so I replaced it what that would have caused is some of the buttons wouldn't have worked properly because it's using those as pull-ups for the buttons and on the other board I noticed that this chip was missing which is an LM3900 and after looking on the schematics it's the final pre-amplified audio going out to the monitor and the chip was just missing I mean it was somewhat cleanly desoldered there was one trace hanging in the air that had separated but uh, socketing and putting in a new chip fixed that too so here are all four of my beauties. They all pass tests, they all work, even though I do have a bit of a shortage of CPUs and PPUs, but I'm sure that uh, those will turn, turn up because it will be kind of nice to have the boards complete and ready to go. So uh, when they get put into a cabinet, you can just swap out boards which basically consists of pulling the two edge connectors, removing one board, sliding a new one in, and uh, off you go. So that's it for this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. 
And what we're going to do next time is have a look how these uh, how these boards uh, fare in their natural environment. And that's all I'm going to say for now. So uh, so please like, subscribe if you haven't done so already, so you can see the next episode. And when you subscribe, make sure to hit that bell and leave me a comment. I love to read about what you think. Later.